uh, which uh, yeah may sound like an unusual path perhaps uh, but yeah that was like the I'd say it's more the other way around because I was interested in uh -huh. higher category that I got interested into type theory. But oh, yeah. I see. So you were already interested in higher category yeah, before yeah. the advent of uh, POST. I see. Okay. But right now, this is your uh, main research area, right? Yeah. The theory of higher categories. And uh, you also managed to, in, to, to uh, obtain some, some nice results here. You have some. Uh, some partial results towards the uh, growth and homotopy hypothesis. And also you proved a special case of the Simpson conjecture, uh, like the case for infinity groupoids. Yeah. Uh, um, which is a, a conjecture, by the way, that uh, if I understand it correctly, aims at fixing the mistake that was present in Kapranov and Wojewski's paper on uh, uh, the the model on the for the yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but uh, so today you're going to speak about something in between higher categories and logic, uh, and this is a higher categorical and homotopy invariant language. So please take the stage. Thank you very much for the introduction, and yeah, it was pretty accurate. Um, so. Okay, so the, what I want to talk today, what I want to talk about uh, today is something I call either higher categorical language or homotopy invariant language. Uh, so I'm going to explain what that means in the first and the beginning of the talk. Um, and I should say that the, currently this is uh, partly joint work with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Cesar Bardomiano Martinez. So I actually started working on that project a long time ago, like before uh, Cesar uh, started his PhD. I gave a talk on this, like I think back in 2020. Uh, but then I kind of stopped working on that for a long time because I was interested in other things. And last year, Cesar uh, like picked it up and we started working on it together and he filled some gap uh, and improved a lot of my results. So hopefully uh, we'll have a preprint on this available very soon, like by the summer or something like that. Um, I should also say that, uh, yeah, I should also say that uh, this is strongly inspired by your previous work by Mackay uh, on first order logic with dependent sort or folds. Uh, and I don't won't really have time in the talk to explain the exact connection with fold and like why it's different and why it's more general maybe. Uh, but if you're familiar with Fold and you have a question about that connection, please ask me at the end. I'll be happy to uh, say more about it. I just it just didn't fit in the talk and it would, was too much work to introduce Fold. Um, okay, so before we talk about higher categorical language, I'm going to say a few words about ordinary categorical language. Uh, and by that, I refer to um, a, a theorem that has been proved several times by different people. Uh, as far as I know, the two oldest reference on the topic are Freyd and Blanc, uh, two separate papers. Uh, and basically the theorem say that there is something called the language of categories, which essentially is the first order language of the theory of category, but in which you can't use equality between objects. You can only talk about equality between parallel morphism, but it doesn't make sense to say that two objects are equal. Uh, and when you write down formula in this language, they automatically have very nice category theoretic property. Uh, in, the first one is that they are invariant under isomorphism, meaning that if your, for, uh, if your formula depends on some parameters, so those parameters, you know, they are object of morphism of your category, and you replace all those parameters by isomorphic ones, like you replace every object by an isomorphic object, and you transport uh, the arrow along those isomorphism. Uh, then you do not change the validity of the formula. If the formula was true before the replacement, then it's still true after the replacement. And the second invariance property is that it's invariant under equivalence. So this means that if you have an equivalence of categories and the formula is valid for one category, then only if it's valid for the other. And if the formula has parameter, it's valid uh, for those parameters taken in C, then only if it's valid for their image under F uh, in D. Um, so yeah, this is an old theorem uh, of category theory and logic. Uh, and the goal basically is to generalize that, that to any kind of higher category, higher structure, and we'll see to even other things. Um, so let me give some example of formula in that language just to give a more precise idea of what I'm talking about. 
So for example, we can look at this, uh, this formula here. So it has a parameter X, sorry. Uh, it has a parameter X uh, and it says that the object X is subterminal, meaning that for every other object and for every pair of morphism uh, from this other object to X, the two morphisms are equal. So there is at most one morphism from each, each object to X. And as you can see, it doesn't use equality on object. And so the theorem in its precise form say that uh, this formula is invariant under isomorphism, meaning if X prime is isomorphic to X and one of them is subterminal, then the other is as well. And that equivalence of category preserves subterminal object. Uh, other example, you can strengthen the proposition to X being terminal if you add that there is actually a morphism from Z to X. So that for every Z, there is a unique morphism from Z to X. Or to give a different example, you can say that some arrow is a monomorphism. Uh, so for every, so you, then now the parameter is an arrow between two objects. Uh, and for every other object Z and every pair of map from Z to X, if FG equals FH, then G equals H. And again, no equality between objects, only equality between morphisms that live in the same arm set. Um, so equality between objects would obviously break those nice invariance property. Uh, if you look at the formula that two objects are equal, it's neither invariant and isomorphism, no equivalence, because an equivalence can send non-equal object to the same object, assuming the two objects in the first place were isomorphic. Uh, or if you have two, uh, two objects that are equal, you can replace one by an isomorphic one and they are no longer equal, or the other way around. Start with two objects that are not equal, replace one uh, by an isomorphic one, which is equal if the two objects were isomorphic. So you can't have equality on object. Uh, so yeah, the language has to be restricted. You, you can't have uh, equality on object. And in particular, you can't have equality between arbitrary, arbitrary arrow either, because if you have equality between arbitrary arrow, then you recover equality between object as X equal Y, if and only if identity of X equal identity of Y. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, the point is we can only talk about equality between two arrows that have the same source and target. And here we have a little bit of a problem because we can't say that the source of an arrow and the source of an other arrow are the same because that would be equality on object. So the way we get around that uh, is we use dependent sort. Uh, for every pair of objects, we have a set or so, a type or sort or whatever on X, Y, which is a type of function of arrow from X to Y. And then instead of saying that F and J have the same source and target, we say that F and J are both elements of that set on X, Y. So we're going to need dependent type or dependent source. I'm going to call them type most of the time, but for me, those words are synonymous. Um, so yeah, so as I say, my goal is to define a similar first order language for other kinds of algebraic structures that have an interesting homotopy theory. That's what I mean by a higher categorical structure. It, it has to have some kind of homotopy theory going on. So for categories, this homotopy theory or higher structure, it manifests itself in the fact that the natural notion of sameness for object is not equality, but isomorphism. And the natural notion of sameness for category is not isomorphism, but it's equivalence of category. And the point is that the language has to, the goal of this language is that it has to respect this notion of sameness. Uh, so that, you know, the validity of formula is the same for objects that are the same. Um, so there are two big motivations for that. The first one is a very practical one. Uh, if you look at theorem, like, I don't know, an object isomorphic to a terminal object is terminal or something isomorphic to a limit is a limit. Those are like fairly obvious theorem, but we kind of have to prove that for every category theoretic notion. Uh, and it's not difficult, it's just lost time. And when we go to, for example, higher category, it's getting more and more annoying. Like uh, if you want to show that, I don't know, some kind of weak, like lax limit for two categories, this is invariant under, this notion is invariant under isomorphism. And by isomorphism there, I mean like by equivalence of by category, uh, this is getting a little bit more complicated. And when you go to infinity category, it's actually sometimes some, some amount of work. And you do have to do that for every single notion. So it's kind of annoying. And we would like to be able to have some kind of abstract theorem, which make, I mean, we don't have to do it. We know everything is invariant, like we do in category theory. We never bother proving things are properly invariant and isomorphism if we have defined them uh, using this category theoretic language. And the second one is more theoretical. 
uh, is that this kind of opens the door to do higher categorical model theory, because you can think of as like, those would be the correct class of formula to consider if you want to select out uh, subclasses of some higher structure. Like instead of taking like a category of sigma structure, you can start with some higher structure and then look at the formulas that are properly invariant under the equivalence. And those make sense in an infinity categorical setting and you can do, or n categorical setting if you don't want to go to infinity and you can start thinking about basically using model theory for higher structures. Uh, so I'm not there yet, but this is kind of the motivation. Today, I'm only going to define what the languages in which we're going to write the formula, uh, you know, I'm only going to define what the theory is. I'm not going to prove any theorem except the homotopy invariance property uh, for those theories. Those, this would be like future works. Um, so let me give you a general overview of how the setting works, and then I'll go gradually more into details. Um, so let me start with ordinary like model theory. So you start, you have a signature sigma, which is the set of set function between them uh, operation. And first order formula are written using sigma and interpreted in sigma structure. So the sigma structure is something where, you know, each thing of the, in the signature is interpreted as a set function or relation. And then a formula is either true or false. Maybe it has some parameter given a sigma structure. Uh, so in our setting, the signature sigma, as I said, it has to be replaced by some kind of dependent type theory because we're going to need those dependent type uh, to compensate for the fact that we don't have full equality. Uh, but also it's going to be convenient to have equality axiom as part of the signature. Uh, this might sound a little bit strange if you come from logic and model theory. Uh, there are two reasons to do that. The first one is that when you do ordinary model theory, you don't need to have equality as part of the signature because you can put it as an axiom later. It can be part of the theory of the first order part. Uh, those are like special, special axiom you can have. There are simple, it's a very simple axiom, but you can put them as axiom. Uh, but here we're gonna restrict equality. So we are not gonna be able to put equality in the first order language part. So that's why we put some equality in the signature because we won't be able to do it later. It would be possible to study things that are defined without equality. It would make sense. It's a nice class of theories, uh, but uh, it's kind of, it will be a restriction we put on ourselves uh, for no reason. Um, and it will prevent us to talk about a lot of interesting examples. Uh, but there is a more serious reason is that the kind of homotopy theory we want to look at, uh, it has to be defined at the level of sigma structure because the formula are applied to sigma structure and we want the formula to be invariant under this homotopy theory, whatever it is. Uh, and so this homotopy theory has to be some, some things that happen at the level of sigma structure. Uh, and I mean, often the equa some equation are needed to get an interesting homotopy theory. Like I have an interesting homotopy theory of category of chain complexes, uh, of quasi category or whatever. Uh, but I don't have an interesting homotopy theory for the things that are just like interpretation of the structure of category, like something is just just set of objects, set of morphism, bunch of function with between them, but no axiom. That's not something where you have an interesting homotopy theory. So you do need to put some equality as part of what I would call the signature so that we can set up this homotopy theory. Okay, so to summarize, there are three steps. The signature, it will be something called a generalized algebraic theory or a Cartmel theory. I'll recall briefly what they are, but basically they are dependently typed algebraic theory. Uh, and then we're gonna need to assume that we have some kind of homotopy theory going on. So this will be a certain model category structure on the category of T model. Basically, there has to be an interesting homotopy theory for the T models. Uh, so again, T is just the signature at this point. Uh, and then from there, we're gonna build the first order homotopy invariant language uh, on top of that theory T. Uh, so formula are meant to be interpreted only in the vibrant object of the model structure and not in all T models. So there is a bit of interaction between one and two uh, here. Uh, it might sound like a restriction, but it's a very, very natural thing to do. Uh, so if you're a bit familiar with like higher category and stuff, um, if we want to have a language to talk about, like for example, I don't know, quasi-category, uh, so which is a model for infinity one category, 
quasi-category are the vibrant object of a certain model category structure on simplicial sets. And so the theory T in that case would be the theory of simplicial set. And then there is a model structure on this where the vibrant object are the quasi-category. And that would give us the homotopy language of quasi-category. That's how it works. OK, so let's quickly recall what a generalized algebraic theory is or a cartmel theory. So it's basically a kind of multi-sorted algebraic theory. So by algebraic theory, I mean something with only totally defined function and equation between them. Uh, but here, it's not just multi-sorted. The sort can depend on parameters. So it's dependently typed. Um, so that makes the definition um, a little bit tricky because so before defining function, you need to define what are the types because you know the function are defined on the types. And creating new function actually can create new type because you have dependent types. So like if you have a type that depends on parameters, then you can plug value of function in those parameters. And so new function create new type, and then you can have function defined on those new type and so on. And so you get kind of a, everything is defined through some kind of inductive process, which is fairly subtle to set up. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the exact formal definition because that would take like half an hour. Uh, to go into this subtle induction process. So instead, I'm going to give you an example and see the different kind of stuff we can have. So my main example, because I want to you know, recover this fried blanc uh, language, um, is the theory of categories. So the theory of categories, I, I see it as having two types. Uh, it has a sort or a type of, ob, of object. And then for each pair of objects, you have a type of morphism on x, y. Uh, and then identity and composition are defined as operations. So I are denoting them like this. So what's left of the turnstile is like the domain of definition of the operation. And then our right of the turnstile, you have the, the type of the operation. So for example, the identity takes an object, of, takes an object and give you an element of um, XX. And the composition, it takes three objects, morphism between them. Uh, and it gives you a composite which is in the correct onset. So this is how you specify operation. And then you have equation on top of that. So for example, uh, here I've written one of the identity axiom. So if you have two objects, you have an arrow between them, then you compose the arrow with the identity and you get the arrow itself. Um, so and of course there is like two more axioms, the other identity and the associativity axiom. And that's it, that gives you the theory of category. Um, so what I'm going to call a context is a basically a consistent, finite, or at least well-ordered, we can do infinitary stuff if we want, uh, set of variables. So for example, this kind of thing that appear on the left of the turnstile here, this is a context. Uh, you have some variable, uh, they can depend on each other, but in a consistent way. Uh, so yeah, another example of context, not quite the same, the arrow here are not composable. Um, so this is a context in the theory of category. Model are defined in the obvious way. Uh, and not that if you have a model X and a context gamma, then you can form a set X of gamma. Uh, those are the interpretation of the context gamma in X. Uh, so for example, if I look at my example above, uh, so I have this context and a model here would be a category. And the C of gamma would be, well, I'm taking like three objects and two arrow between them in C. So this is what C gamma is. Uh, it's, yeah, this is this set. Um, so there is a, an actual definition, like this is actually a functor on a certain category of context, and you can defend, define model as functor preserving some limits uh, if you want to. We don't need to go into that. Um, OK, so well, now that we have our signature, our Cartmel theory, let's define the logic. So I'm going to fix T, uh, generalized algebraic theory, or Cartmel theory. Uh, it can be infinitary if I want, that's fine. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, given a context gamma in T, I'm going to define inductively the set F gamma of first order formula that are in context gamma, uh, meaning those whose free variable are taken from gamma. And so this is an inductive definition. Uh, so the first thing is that the formula true and false are formulas. Uh, if you have two formula in context gamma, then you can form their negation, conjunction, disjunction, or any kind of logical operator. Those are still formula in context gamma. 
Uh, you can allow infinite conjunction and disjunction if you want to. We can do infinitary logic, that's fine. Uh, all the theorem I'm going to state are true both for finitary and infinitary logic. Uh, then we have uh, quantifiers. So quantifiers are a bit more subtle. Uh, so if you have a context gamma prime, which has a context gamma plus one variable, so and I've not written it, but here the t can depend on the variable in gamma, of course. Uh, and you have phi, a formula in this extended context gamma prime, then you can form uh, exist x in t phi or for all x in t phi, and those are formula in context gamma. Again, the t can depend on parameter uh, in the context gamma. I just haven't written them so that it's stay readable. You can also allow quantifying over an infinite number of variables at the same time if you're doing uh, infinitary logic, that's also fine. Uh, and uh, so that's it. Those are the only formula I'm considering. Uh, I'm considering them up to some logical rule, like uh, I'm not going to list the detail, but for example, you want to set f gamma uh, to be a Boolean algebra. So this is kind of rule. Um, so you might be surprised to notice that I have not included equality at all, uh, nor any atomic formula beyond true and false. So this is strange. Uh, you might get the impression that because I don't have atomic formula, I don't get any interesting formula because if you take true and false and apply logical operator on them, you're always going to get either true or false. Um, so this is only an illusion. Uh, there is a kind of bootstrapping process, uh, which is done by combining those formula true and false with quantifiers. The thing is, if you write, uh, if, you, if A is a type in context gamma, and you write this formula, but so I'm, it's a shortcut, I'm writing exist x in A to mean exist x in A such that true. Uh, this is in general a non-trivial formula because as A depends on parameter, maybe it's gonna be empty for some value of the parameter and non-empty for other value of the parameter. And so the formula exist x in A is a non-trivial uh, formula. That's basically what plays the role of the atomic formula. Uh, then you can combine those uh, with logical operator and build more complicated formula and then apply quantifier again and get even more complicated stuff. Uh, however, there's still a little bit of a problem. We still don't have equality at all. And in the original example I gave you, there was some equality present. It was possible to talk about equality between morphism. Uh, and so, so far we don't recover that initial example, uh, but there is a trick. Uh, the trick is we can create a way to talk about equality of term of a chosen type, not we don't want equality of, for all type, like we don't want equality for object, we only want equality for morphisms. Uh, and we can create that by changing the Cartmel theory, by changing the signature. That's where the equality axiom in the signature are gonna play a role. Um, so what we're gonna do is, so we have our theory T and we're constructing a new theory, let's say T prime. And in T prime, we are adding uh, a new type so A is a type in, in T, uh, in context gamma, and I'm adding this new type, which is the type uh, X equals Y for X and Y, two elements of A. So it's a dependent type. It depends on whatever A can depend on, and it depends on two more parameters in A. And I'm denoting it like this equality in A. It's a little bit like the identity type in, in type theory, but not quite. It's a, like a reflexive identity type. Um, so I'm going to call this type the equality predicate for A. And what makes it an equality predicate is that I'm adding some axioms. Uh, so I'm adding something that say that if I have an element of type A, then I have like a reflexivity element of type X equal X. Uh, if I have a term of type X equal Y, then actually X equal Y. So this is a key thing. If you have a term of the equality type, then X equal Y. So this is where we're using equality axiom in the theory T or T prime here. Uh, and then finally, another thing is that if you have a term of type X equal Y, well, then you know from the previous axiom that X equal Y, and then you also ask that T is the reflexivity term. So because of those three axioms, we, we have changed the theory, but the models are the same. Uh, because if you look at the model of this new theory T prime, this type uh, X equal Y, it has to be interpreted as singleton reflexivity X if X equal Y and uh, empty if X is not equal to Y. So the models of this new theory T prime are the same. But now we have 
more dependent types. So we have more formula in the first order language. And in particular, we can define this formula x equal y as a shortcut for the existing term of types x equal y. So to come back to our example of uh, the theory of categories, uh, the actual theory of category we consider is the one I've given you before, but we also add an equality predicate on OM, which looks like this for every pair of objects and every pair of parallel morphism. You have this type uh, F equal G uh, in type OM XY. And then we put all the axiom, uh, both of category theory and the one of the previous slide. This is what I want to consider as the theory of categories. We have the type of object, the type of morphism, and the equality predicate on morphism. This is a correct uh, thing to consider in this framework. Uh, and now if you look at the formula uh, in this new Cartmel theory of categories, you recover exactly the fray blanc language that I was referring to in the beginning, which I haven't defined precise, precisely, so you can take this as, as the definition of this language, this category theoretic language. Um, so very small digression, I need to talk a little bit about the certain weak factorization system. Um, so when you have a Cartmel theory, uh, the category of model come with a one piece uh, of additional structure, uh, which is a certain weak factorization system. So there is a, a left class that I'm going to call cofibration because it's going to be correspond to a model structure later. Uh, and so cofibration are essentially the map that are obtained. You, so you start from a model A and you create a new model B by freely adding element to specify type in it. You just freely add element. You don't add equation. And so the map you can obtain this way, this is what I call the co-fibration. And then there is a right class, which I'm going to call trivial fibration, again, because there's going to be a model structure in the background later. Um, and there's a map are the thing which have So there's a map with what we call the term lifting property. Essentially, it means that there are morphisms which are surjective on all type. But we have to be careful about what that means because type depend on parameters that can live in X. So it means that uh, every time you have a, a type axiom, so you have a type A that depend on parameter in a context gamma, and every time you choose an interpretation of gamma in X, then uh, for every element of a Y at the same as the image of those parameter uh, in the type A, you have a lift in X. So it's surjective on uh, each type, but for every choice of parameter in X. Uh, you have to look at some examples to really get familiar with that. But those two class from a weak factorization system is cofibrantly generated. And in fact, uh, Jonas Frey has recently given a complete characterization of the category of models of Cartmel theory equipped with a factorization system. So given a category and a factorization system, we have a very fairly simple criterion to know if it comes from a, from a uh, Cartmel theory or not. Uh, so let me give one example of this factorization system. So I'm going to take this theory of category with an equality predicate, the one I just did like a couple of slides ago. Uh, then, uh, so what are the cofibration? Cofibration, so you start from a category, you can freely add objects. So this is a new object that are like disconnected from the first category. Then you can freely add morphism between any two objects. So you can add morphism between those new objects or between already existing objects or between the two. And then you can freely add term of type the equality predicate, which means you can take two morphism, parallel morphism, and add a term of the equality predicate, which is going to make them equal. Uh, and so you can collapse any two parallel morphism. And if you combine those three operations, you can add object, add arrow, collapse arrow. You can get almost any functor. The only thing you can't get is to collapse two objects. So you get all functors that are injective on objects. So the co-fibration are the injective on object functors. Uh, and the trivial fibration, so you, you can lift objects, so it's surjective on objects. You can lift morphism between every chosen object, so it's a full functor. And then you can lift term of the equality type, so it's injective on morphism, on parallel morphism. And so the trivial fibration are the fully faithful and surjective functor. And if you're a little bit familiar with the theory of model category, you recognize that those are the cofibration and the trivial fibration of something called the canonical or the fault model structure on cat, which is a model structure on cat where the equivalents are the equivalents of categories, like the most natural model structure on categories, on the category of categories. And so this is going to be the important uh, connection. Um, so uh, let me. Uh, say something else before I move to model of categories. 
Um, so this is actually a theorem which uh, is mostly due to Mackay. It was in the context of full. I've just generalized it to that context, but it's mostly the same idea. Is that I, uh, just with the, what we've done before, just with a Cartmel theory and the language we've defined, we have this kind of invariance. We have that if a, ma if a map from X to Y is a trivial vibration and phi is a formula in some context, then basically it says that phi is true for X if and only if phi is true for Y. Uh, and if it has parameter, you just apply F to the, you start with a parameter in X and you apply the F to the parameters. So we have invariance of formula, but only along trivial vibration. Uh, but this is all we can get without additional structure. We don't, we don't get more natural notion of invariance. We just have those trivial vibration. Uh, those trivial vibration, like they don't satisfy, like they compose composite of two trivial vibration is a trivial vibration, but that's pretty much it. Uh, the point is that the, the setting so far is a little too general. Uh, and we don't have the second key ingredient, which is the homotopy theory of T model. Just the trivial vibration are not enough to set up a nice homotopy theory. Uh, okay, very quick remark. Uh, so it's possible to do all that directly from the category of model of T equipped with factorization system without referring to the syntax at all. Uh, and in fact, when you do it that way, the definition makes sense for any category uh, with such a weak factorization system. Uh, and some co-limit like we don't need it to satisfy uh, Jonas Frey uh, characterization. Uh, and all the results I'm going to say today, I'm going to talk about today still apply to this general setting, but there it's a little less intuitive because I can't tell you as explicitly what are the formula in that setting. The definition of formula is much more, not more complicated, but a lot less intuitive uh, in that setting. So I'd rather do thing in terms of Cartmel theories because this is much more syntactical this way and easier to understand. Um, and you can, in fact, if you do the general thing, you can show that you can always build the Cartmel theory, which gives you the correct formula. So it's not that far from the general situation. Okay, so let's move to model category now. Uh, equivalent model category. So it's a category that has limits and co-limits, and it has three class of map, vibration, co-fibration, weak equivalences, and it satisfies two conditions. Uh, the class of weak equivalents satisfies two out of three. Uh, and we have two weak factorization systems, which are formed of the co-fibration and what we call trivial fibration, meaning the, the intersection of the weak equivalents and the fibration. And same thing, we have a factorization system between the trivial co-fibration and the fibration. And this is what I mean by there is an interesting homotopy or theory of T-model. We can set up one of those. This is the way most modern homotopy theory setup. Uh, if you don't want, like if you like weaker version of model category, like some left semi model category, weak model category, whatever, uh, everything I'm going to say also apply to those. Uh, but yeah. Um, and Right, so the point is that given any model category, I can define a language by taking the co-fibration, trivial fibration, weak factorization system. Uh, but very often, most concrete model category we'll look at already come as model of the correct Cartmel theory, and we can use the syntactical version of the construction to define the language. And so uh, the first theorem, which is not very hard, but it's kind of the goal of all that, is that if you take any Cartmel theory with a model structure, uh, on its category of model, and you assume that the co-fibration and trivial fibration are what they should be, that they are the same for the Cartmel theory and for the model uh, structure, uh, then you have the two invariance property. Uh, you have that for any context gamma, any formula phi in context gamma, and any fibrant uh, T model X and Y. Uh, we have that, so it makes sense to talk about homotopies between two elements of the set X gamma, and you have that if uh, S is homotopic to S prime, then phi of S is equivalent to phi of S prime. Uh, and you have that if F from X to Y is a weak equivalence between two fibrant objects, uh, and S is in X gamma, then phi of S is equivalent to phi, uh, phi of F of S. So those are the two invariance properties that we had at the beginning. The first one is the invariance under isomorphism. Uh, homotopy in the canonical model structure is isomorphism. And the second one is invariance under equivalence because the weak equivalence of the folk model structure are the equivalence of category. Uh, so that's what I just said. Uh, when you apply this to the folk model structure on category or the canonical model structure, 
uh, you recover uh, invariance under isomorphism and in the invariance under equivalence. And so basically, this automatically produces a version of that theorem for any kind of higher structure for which we have a moral structure. So pretty much any kind of moral structure we're actually using, like the one that don't have moral structure are the one that we don't use because we don't know how to study the homotopy uh, theory. Uh, so for example, you have a version of the theorem for n categories, for monoidal category, for spaces, for quasi category, for chain complex, for spectra. Uh, yeah, any kind of higher structure you can think of where there is a good notion of homotopy and equivalence and so on. Um, so finally, there is a third kind of equivalent of invariance of this language, which is very interesting. This is much harder to prove. That's actually one of the results where there was a lot of input of, from Cesar. Uh, I think the paper would not have appeared without Cesar's simplification of the proof. Um, so if you have two model category, which are quid and equivalent, so they represent the same homotopy theory, but they live on different categories. Uh, so different Cartmel theory, but they are this, the home, at the level of homotopy theory, they are equivalent. Uh, then the two languages are what I call semantically equivalent. So the formula are not the same because they come from different types and structure, like they live on different sigma structures or different language, but there is a translation process between the two and you can turn the formula in one language into a formula in the other that have the same semantical interpretation, like their validity in homotopy equivalent model are the same. Uh, and so this is really interesting because as you know, for higher category, we have many different non-equivalent, like non-algebraically equivalent, but homotopically equivalent definition of n categories. And it's not completely clear to what extent a theorem proof for one definition can be transported into a theorem for another. And so this is what this says is that as long as those theorem can be phrased in the homotopy invariant language of the small structure, we can transport them in a completely automatic way. Um, so it's also a very, pra very practical thing for uh, the higher category theory where you know, if something has been proved for quasi categories and I know I can apply to, I don't know, Hesk space or some other model of infinity category if I want to. Uh, yeah, so this is what I just said. Um, so finally, let me quickly go over some example of that. So as I say, the canonical model structure on the category of categories is recovers the Freud Blanc language from the beginning. Uh, you also have the lack or canonical model structure on two category or by category. Uh, and so this produces a language where you, so you, in this language, you can't talk about neither the equality between object or the equality between one cell, but you can talk about equality between parallel two cell. And so this lets you define that a one cell is an isomorphism and that, and that, um, uh, yeah, that a one cell is no, sorry, that the one cell is an equivalent. That's what I meant. It lets you define that the one cell is an equivalence. Uh, so in this model structure, the weak equivalents are the biomotopy and the isomorphism are uh, isomorphism at the level of uh, one cell and uh, equivalents at the level of zero cell. Um, yeah, and so we have this homotopy invariant language for two category or bi category as well. Uh, if you look at, for example, chain complex with the projective model structure, uh, what you get with the injective model structure is very complicated. I don't completely understand it, but because it's quite equivalent, it's semantically the same. Uh, but with the projective model structure, the language is fairly simple. Uh, so basically, you can talk about the element of each group in each degree. You can, you can never talk about equality between elements, but given an X, you can form the type of thing whose differential is X. So you can, for example, look at the thing whose differential is zero, or uh, if you have two elements X and Y, so you can't talk about whether they're equal or not, but you can define their, the homotopy relation as a shortcut for there is a V whose differential is uh, X minus Y. So you can talk about uh, equivalent uh, elements in the homology, for example. So that's the language for the chain complex. Uh, and if you take the Joyal or the Quillen model structure on simplicial sets, then the uh, underlying Cartmel theory is the same. So you get the same class of formula in both case. Uh, the, the Cartmel theory is the, the theory of simplicial set. Uh, and in, so the language you get, you have no equality allowed at all. Uh, but the type of n simplex is seen as a dependent type over its boundary. So for example, you have the type of zero simplex so it's the type. And then for every two zero simplex, you can form the one, the type of one simplex between them. So it's like the type of arrow from V0 to V1. 
And then if I have three objects, V0, V1, V2, and three one cell from V0 to V1, uh, V0 to V2, and V1 to V2, then I can form the type X2 of filling of the triangle, so of two cell that fills the triangle, and so on in each dimension. Uh, so you can never talk about equality between any kind of cell, but you can always uh, say, okay, I have a two cell that's an equivalence between uh, some uh, one cell, for example. Uh, and so you can never say that things are equal, but you can always express that some cells are isomorphic up to some even higher cells. Uh, and so most notion of the theory of quasi category can be formulated in this language. Not quite all, sometimes they use things a little bit strictier in the theory of quasi category, but most notion like, I don't know, that something is an initial or a terminal uh, object or that something is a limit uh, and so on. All those things uh, are phrased naturally in that language. And so they are automatically uh, invariant in all the, sen the three senses I've talked about. So invariance uh, under replacing object by, uh, by replacing zero cell by equivalent one, uh, invariant by equivalence of quasi category or equivalence of, uh, of infinity groupoid and invariance by if you move to a different model structure like single space or I don't know simplicial category or other model of infinity one category then all those theorem will be transported or not transported but translated into theorem uh, there. Um, okay so that's it I just want to finish quickly by mentioning some thing we are thinking about or might be interesting to think about in the future. So the first thing is to look at more example. Uh, there is a huge number of different model category of interest. Uh, so for example, for all those examples I've mentioned before, I can look at the model structure on the on arrows. Uh, if you have a model structure, then you can build a new model structure on its arrow category. Uh, and so this gives you property of arrow instead of morphism. Uh, and there is actually a different model structure you can put on the arrow category, like a there's two ready structure on the just one arrow. So you have at least two different model structures. So this gives you two different language to talk about arrow and they basically correspond to a difference between arrow and vibration in some sense. Uh, then as I said in the beginning, this opens the door to do some kind of model, struct, model theory for higher structures. Uh, we have the correct class of formula and because those formula are actually defined as a subclass of formula in one category, like in ordinary first order logic, there is actually a lot of stuff coming from model theory that can we can apply fairly directly. We're just working with a restricted class of formula that are better behaved uh, in the higher context. Um, so from the point of view of practical application by you know, using that to work with concrete model category, uh, first order is nice, but we might be interested in also having a higher order language, like being able to quantify not just over for example, if I work with quasi-category, I might want to quantify over quasi-category, like say that I have a, for every quasi-category, I have something. Uh, so can we do some kind of higher order version of that language? Uh, and so finally, the, the fried blanc uh, language can also be used to discuss stacks. Uh, it's one way to phrase internal logic. Uh, if you have a stacks of category over a category, uh, like a like a weak pre-shift of categories, you know, then you can talk about it using the stacks, uh, the freight blanc language. Uh, and so it's, um, I actually don't know to what extent we can generalize that to other higher structure so that we could look at stacks of higher categories. Uh, one difficulty here is that the language I've defined is, uh, is like full first order, Boolean language. Uh, and for the stack semantic, we need something intuitionistic. So here there are some modification to be made uh, before we can do that. Um, and that's it. I think I was supposed to talk for 45 minutes. So this is, uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks, Simon, for the nice talk. Um, do we have any questions or comments, remarks? Um, I can ask you a clarification in the meantime. So mm -hmm. uh, you you said that uh, uh, I mean you you showed us how uh, certain instances of your uh, invariance theorem, let's say, let's call it this way, uh, hold like what they give rise to in in various model categories. Uh, 
but uh, your theorem, unless I miss something, uh, applies to model categories that are model categories on the category of models of some Cartman theory. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the so point you need is, to, yeah. uh, to like uh, present them as models of some as categories of models of some Cartman theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to use the syntactical approach, you have to figure out what is the correct Cartman theory that give you the correct co-fibration and trivial vibration. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, it's possible to define the formula directly from the category with factorization system. Uh -huh, right. So you don't necessarily need to find the Cartman theory, but at an intuitive level, it's so much easier to figure out what is the correct Cartman theory first so that yeah. you your language as a syntactic presentation instead of yeah, purely so you have a graph of the one. language yeah yeah but it's okay. uh it's actually fairly easy once you're a bit familiar with how the um, how you go from a cartmel theory to a factorization system to like reverse engineer mm -hmm. the the cartmel theory from the factorization system basically you look at the generating co-fibration and you want a type axiom for each generating co-fibration right and then you want the model to be the object of your category and generally it's pretty obvious how to do that Okay. That's it. Thanks. But don't don't you get some uh, to some extent uh, second order or n-ary order logic by the fact that you have dependent types? I don't follow very much this part that you said there. That's a good question. Um, so when I say I get first order logic, is because if I so if I have my uh, my Cartmel theory, it's the category of model is actually the same as the category of model of like an essentially algebraic theory. And if I look at my formulas in terms of that essentially algebraic theory, those are just a subclass of formula of the first order formula for that essentially algebraic theory. Now there is a sense in which you kind of get a bit of higher logic because well, if you talk about categories then you can quantify over object and quantification over object has to do with having higher order logic, right? Um, so for example, that's how the stack semantic works. The stack semantics only interpret first order formula, but then because it can interpret first order formula that talks about object, you can use it as a kind of higher order logic and it actually encompasses the higher order internal logic of toposes. Um, so there is a sense in which you can do higher order logic with that because you can add object as part of the signature and quantify over object. But concretely, those are first order formula about the kind of algebraic structure you're talking about. Like they are first order formula about categories. Does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Other questions? Um, maybe I can ask you something else then. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, it's, uh, so uh, I was wondering uh, if you can uh, maybe say something about the connection with uh, uh, the same kind of uh, invariance that you get in homotopy type theory. Uh, uh, right, there, right. There's this thing called the structure identity principle. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That also considers structures defined uh, using Mackay's fold. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so, okay, maybe I'll answer fold first because this is fairly easy. So, the, okay. for, so in fold, Mackay kind of choose to not work with Cartmel theory, especially say so in the introduction, uh -huh. because it doesn't want to have a quality axiom at all. But this is only a philosophical point, and I don't think that would have changed anything in his paper if we would have allowed. Uh, equality axiom as part of the theory. This mm -hmm. is the main difference with four, that I'm allowing equality axiom and this allow me to cover things like chain complex or even simplicial set. Um, the, the other difference is that Mackay don't assume that he has a model structure, he never used model structure. And so he only gets the first kind of invariance that I talked about along trigger vibration. And then he kind of tried to do things about it with that, but it doesn't work as well as what you get when you have a model structure. So he, he doesn't call them trivial vibrations. He called, I don't remember. Yeah, he calls them very surjective or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, makes sense. Or no, he calls them L equivalents, I think. Okay. 
I, I, I don't remember the terminology. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, this is the idea. Because they don't assume that he has a moral structure, he don't, in the general theory, he doesn't have. He, like the theory works well on example, but the general theory isn't that as nice. So the connection with art is a lot more subtle. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to think of what I talked about <clears throat> today as being a, a generalization of how in art, by weakening equality to identity type, you, uh, you get the ability to talk about homotopy theoretic structure in a homotopy invariant way. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the same phenomenon, but here it's in a, in a somehow more general setting because I'm not assuming anything about what my identity type are. I'm going to end up having stuff right. that looks like identity type because I can talk about homotopies uh, from the, point, the internal point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are not like they don't necessarily come from the kind same kind of induction principle that you have in homotopy type theory. They don't necessarily have this globular shape that the uh, identity type of type theory right. have. Yeah. Um, so it's the same ideas that if you remove equality, use dependent type instead of equality to be able to do stuff, then you get the ability to talk about higher structure but done in a much more general setting than hot. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this recover hot, that's not the point, but this is kind yeah. of how I think about the connection. Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks. I mean, I can see why it uh, doesn't quite make sense to, to recover hot as a, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a language in itself. Um, but yeah, it would be nice maybe to to be able to use this framework to uh, to show that this uh, uh, structure identity principle holds in right, right. So the, 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 yeah, there one. we get into the problem that it's really hard to do algebraic structure in hot. Right. Uh, so I so. guess we could do that for like truncated structure, uh, uh -huh. or we would have to use one of the extension of hot that is able to deal with algebraic structure, like two level stuff. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, that that would be the main problem. That you know, what I'm talking about rely heavily on the fact that I'm using algebraic structures, uh, and this is very complicated to do in hot, or even right. impossible in base hot. Okay. Uh, other questions for you no? Uh, otherwise, yeah, seems there are none. So, yeah, thank you again for the very nice talk. Well, thank you for the invitation. I was really happy to talk about that again. And, uh, well, thanks to everyone for joining today. And uh, we meet again next month. Uh, I don't remember exactly the day. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, the fifth of April with Mirna Zamon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.